All right, it's Thursday, Rami Lavi podcast. We're now a couple of days removed from literally one of the craziest Knicks wins I've ever seen. And I watched it um, not live, obviously, but I watched it a couple of days later and I had no idea what happened in the game. I didn't know if the Knicks won or lost the game when I time that I watched it. But yes, I was able to stay off everything and wait till the game. And then finally, when I got a chance to sit down and watch it, I watched it and I was thinking, all right, going back to Philly 1-1. And the thing I keep coming back to, because it's one of the craziest Knicks wins of my lifetime. And I saw somebody said this, if you're a Knicks fan and if you're, you grew up in the, if you watch the Knicks in the nineties, you have the four point play. Obviously, if you saw the seventies, you have the championships, whoever you are as a Knicks fan, if you are a Knicks fan who is my age, probably 30 years or younger, this is your big Knicks win. You don't have a win like this outside of this game. This game is incredible. This game doesn't happen. This is a game where you score eight points in the final 25, 27 seconds. That's crazy. That doesn't happen. And the Knicks, it's a it's a resiliency thing. And what I keep coming back to is I mentioned this on an episode after the play-in game with Miami and Philly. Philly had a hard time inbounding that ball at the end of that game where they, they almost didn't know what to do. And Bede and Maxi both go for the ball. The inbound was kind of off. Luckily for them... There wasn't enough time left on the clock. The ball goes out of bounds. If there was a second longer, if there was 0.5 seconds longer, Miami gets a shot at the, they couldn't handle the end of the game. They had the lead and they almost blew it. That end of the game situation, Philly foobarred it. And yet they got lucky that the clock just ran out. There just wasn't enough time. Tyler Hero took an extra half second on his side step three. Well, the Knicks had that extra half second. And so when you look at teams that you call winners and losers, this is what I always say. Winners find ways to win, find ways to get it done. Losers make excuses. Losers say, well, they grabbed, well, the two-minute report, well, this, well, that. Find a way to close out the game. Find a way to get it done. And what a win. And it tells you everything you need to know about the never-say-die mentality of the New York Knicks. This New York Knicks team, they, they never think they're out of it. They always think they can come back in a game. They always think no matter what, what is happening, they have a chance in a game. And that translates. I don't care how talented you are. And sure, they have plenty of talent, but I don't care how many superstars or anything of that sort that you have. The Knicks have that mentality that you can't bring them down. That is something that doesn't, you don't lose in the playoffs. That's something that stays with you, that no matter how late in a game it is. Clyde Frazier saying, all right, he's going to the line. Kyle Lowry's going to the line to put them out of their misery. Lowry misses two big free throws late. One there, one earlier on an earlier possession within the last two, three minutes of the game. The Knicks themselves, no matter how many people think they're out of it, never think they're out of it. And Embiid after the game saying, Oh, you know, we should be up 2-0. We're the better team. We're going to win this series. He doesn't believe it. Look at him, head down. He doesn't look excited. He doesn't look confident, despite what he's saying sounds confident. This is a guy who's broken. I don't know how you come back after a game like that. The Garden was on fire. Now you go to Philly tonight, and hopefully the Knicks keep it rolling. Look, Jalen Brunson needs to find a way in this series, but Jalen Brunson hasn't shown up yet. And the Knicks have won two games. Now, Jalen Brunson, without scoring, is finding other ways to affect the game. How about that third quarter when he realized that that two-man game, that two man game with him and Mitchell Robinson, or sorry, him and Isaiah Hartenstein was working. And it was getting Joel Embiid to move more than he wanted to. That was huge. Hartenstein had, what, 12 points in the third quarter? He was awesome down the stretch. He had another big play down the stretch, and obviously the biggest offensive rebound. He just goes in there, and Embiid couldn't jump. Embiid constantly going to the bench, getting that knee reworked on. And it didn't matter. Joel Embiid dominated. Joel Embiid was as good as he could be, all things considered. Tyrese Maxey was insane in this game. He took over late, hit those big shots down the stretch. But guess what? It didn't matter. These two guys had most of the team's points. They were exceptional in this game for the Miami, for the Philadelphia 76ers. And the Knicks still found a way to win. That tells you everything you need to know about this Knicks team. And you know what's so interesting? Even guys like Tobias Harris making huge plays in the first half. Key offensive rebounds late. Kyle Lowry making big plays. Hit a couple big threes. 
It doesn't matter. Those guys made the plays. It's like, well, if these guys get going in the series, the Knicks are really screwed. No, they're not. The Knicks find a way anyway. Isaiah Hartenstein, Bogdanovich, and Deuce making plays in the third quarter and beginning of the fourth to keep them in it. That was incredible. Some great work. They ultimately go up by eight. That bully ball from Deuce just taking the ball away. Bogdanovich hitting a couple of big threes. And like I said, Brunson getting rebounds, fighting over screens, still playing defense, not the bully ball, trying to get his other teammates involved. We've seen this so many times with Nick, quote unquote, superstars in the past, whether it's Carmelo Anthony, whether it's even Julius Randle, who when their shot's not going, they don't affect winning in any other way. Jalen Brunson is not that guy. And trust me, he needs to be better, but he will be. I trust that he will be. I've seen Jalen Brunson dominate in a playoff series. Saw it with the Knicks last year. I saw it with the Dallas Mavericks a couple years ago. I know he's going to come around. I know he's going to find a way. I have confidence in him. I'm not. This is not a double standard for Jalen Brunson and for Julius Randle. Julius Randle, I've never seen him have success in a playoff game. Not once. Jalen Brunson, I've seen it dozens of times. So it's a couple of bad games. It happens. He's had a couple of bad. Look throughout the season, he's had a couple of bad games. Philly's thrown taller, bigger dudes at him over and over again. They've played him well all season. I think Brunson's going to be great tonight. But until then, it doesn't matter. It's a huge game three in Philly tonight. That's what's huge. And what's crazy about this Knicks team is that Mitch dominates in game one and Deuce also dominates in game one. They're huge, right? While Hartenstein and DiFincenzo ride the bench to close out the game. And then in this game, the saviors are Hartenstein and DiFincenzo. Tom Thibodeau making the right calls, making the right plays, playing according to who's hot, who is making the big plays for his team. All those points for Hartenstein. Obviously the rebound, the big threes for DiFincenzo couple other big plays for DiVincenzo. He had a drive to the lane where he went right at Embiid. Tom Thibodeau playing the hot hand, going with what's working. His coaching style is different. Let me tell you that. It's a team. It doesn't matter if one night it's DiVincenzo, one night it's Hartenstein, the other night it's Deuce and Mitchell Robinson. I know that tonight it'll be someone else. I know that in game three, they'll find someone else to step up for them. And this was such a great quote from Tom Thibodeau because Knicks players this is just on, on Twitter. I saw this Knicks players cited Tom Thibodeau's coaching as a big reason for their game two win last night over the Sixers. Isaiah Hartenstein said he believes no game is ever safe because of Tom Thibodeau. Dante DiVincenzo said it wasn't like the game was over. It never is, especially playing for coach Tibbs and Ian Begley. This is my favorite quote. Begley said somewhere late Monday night, one of those anonymous players from the stupid athletic poll. I added stupid. He didn't say it was probably sitting on his couch watching the game, wishing that, wishing that he could be a part of that type of NBA moment. Maybe they'll change their mind about Thibodeau. Exactly. That is exactly my point. Anyone who doesn't believe that Tom Thibodeau is doing the right way, I don't want you. Stay out of there. That's fine. I'm good. We're good over here with what we have. Guys who buy in, guys who have a winner's mentality, guys who have a championship mentality. Guys who know that the game is never over, no, no matter how late it is, no matter how bleak the situation is. Effort, defense, team mentality, over and over and over and over again. Grit, determination. It's what I talked about last episode, and it manifested itself again. And game three is going to be a dogfight. Philly's going to come out strong. They're going to come out hungry. You know that. That's how it always happens when teams are down too well going to their own building. Look, a series doesn't start till the home team loses, right? No home team has lost yet. This series is far from over. But I will tell you one thing. This might be Philly's last chance. My father said something interesting to me. We were watching the game last night together. And he said something. And he said to, to me, he's like, you know, if they go up 3-0, I don't think Embiid plays. He doesn't look healthy. And if they're down 3-0, he probably doesn't play game four. Maybe if they force a game five or game six, he comes back in the series. But down 3-0, I don't think he plays game four. And I think he's right. You know what's so interesting about this? Like, Sometimes I think the best way to do this job is to be removed from social media. Like I wish I could. The best way, I, I don't, not sometimes. I believe the best way to do this job is to be fully removed from social media. To not be seeing different narratives and stuff. Have a clear thought, clear mind of what you want to say. Now, trust some great articles and insiders and people. Obviously, you read The Athletic. You listen to Ian Bagley, people like that who know more than you. You watch the quotes from Thibodeau and obviously the post-game stuff and you, you get all of that stuff. 
but you rid yourself of all of the people who are quote unquote experts and have all these theories on social media. You get rid of all of that and you remove all the narratives and you just look at things for what they are. And my father isn't on social media. When he said that to me, I was like, you know, I haven't seen that anywhere. But if you're watching the games, if you're paying attention, if you're listening to the reports, this dude isn't right. And so for them to be down in 3-0 in a series and force him to play in a game four, continue to force him to go out there, despite him dominating, he doesn't look healthy. I wouldn't. I would probably shut him down if I was Philly at that point. He's questionable before every game. He's questionable again tonight. And it's probably the right move to maybe let him sit, which is why game three is so crucial for the Knicks. The Knicks have to come out and they need to dominate in game three. And Jalen Brunson needs to show up in the series. It's time, Jalen. I, I love Jalen Brunson. I believe Jalen Brunson is going to show up. That's how I feel. I truly do. I'm not, you know, it's not the same as Julius Randle. It's not the same as some past Knicks who have struggled. I believe in this guy. I've seen him do it. I've seen him get it done. Now it's time to prove it. Go out there one game in Philadelphia, dominate. And then who knows what happens in game four, but go up 3-0. The series is not over. The series hasn't started until a home team loses a game. No home team has lost yet. The Knicks took care of their home court as they should. The Knicks have been great at home all year. They have a great home court advantage. That crowd, that pop from the double bang and Mike Breen, it's insane. Watching the Knicks legends on the sideline celebrating, it's incredible. But the Knicks have to go do it on the road. Go drive down the turnpike. Philly is New York South. We've seen them take over that building this year. Go do it. The Knicks, by the way, and, and this is an interesting stat, the Sixers have four losses against or four losses in games that Embiid and Maxi have played together. This is a sad I saw. I think it's true. They have four losses in games that both Maxi and Embiid have played. Three of them have been against the Knicks, the one in the regular season, and now two in the postseason. That's insane. This team has their number. Go get it done in Philly tonight. I believe the Knicks can. Now, the NFL draft is also tonight. It's going to take a backseat to the Knicks, I'm sure. And the Islanders game is also tonight, which is crazy. And obviously everything that happened with the Islanders, I mean, yikes. While the Knicks are having their epic comeback, the Islanders are blowing a 3 nothing lead. In that series, the Rangers are up 2-0. I'll be honest, I saw the highlights. I didn't watch the full Rangers game. That's why I'm just not talking on it, not speaking on it till I see the full game, till I can actually watch it. And I'll sit down and watch it maybe at some point today. And I'll be able to talk about it before pregame, before game three tomorrow. But for the draft, I do think the Giants are going to take a quarterback. I do think they should trade it up and take a quarterback. If it's J.J. McCarthy, somebody compared him to Joe Burrow. I don't hate the comparison. A guy who flies up, has all the intangibles, proven winner. But Joe Burrow had all the talents in college too at LSU. It wasn't like he was just intangibles. I don't love J.J. McCarthy. Um, but I do want to acknowledge, by the way, if this is at all true. John Harbaugh loves J.J. McCarthy so much. Or Jim Harbaugh loves J.J. McCarthy so much. Just draft him yourself. Trade away Justin Herbert. And A.B. went on Twitter and was like, yeah, well, uh, Justin Herbert's being traded to the Minnesota Vikings now. It's Antonio Brown. I get it. I don't know. He's been right about things in the past or whoever's running his social media. Crazy. But uh, that's just wild. We'll see what happens. Always fun things happen in the draft. For the Jets, if the guy you don't love is, if he's not there at 10, and I think they're looking for either the best tackle, Brock Bowers, or one of the top two wide receivers and neighbors, or Harrison. That's what I think they're looking now. Probably like Fashanu or Alt, if one of them are still there. Harrison or neighbors, if one of them are still there. Or Brock Bowers. Those are five guys. If none of those guys are there, trade back. Sauce Gardner tweeted out he thinks they're getting another defensive back or a defensive rusher. That doesn't mean it's happening in the first round. But I do think two things can happen. The Jets can also trade back into the first round if Joe Douglas, this is an all-in year for this year, I could see that happening. I could see Joe Douglas trading next year's first round pick. It's all about this year. If it doesn't work out this year, who knows what happens? The entire team is dismantled. Rodgers is gone. Probably the coaching staff and maybe even Joe Douglas is gone. So the Jets trading back into the first round. Now, an interesting question that I talked about with Chris McMonigle on the fan was, what would it take? What would have to happen in order for the lead story to be the NFL draft tomorrow? Now, if the Knicks go up 3-0, I don't know. And probably it might not be the lead story because... Real, I don't know. It's like the series is over. If they lose the game, then all, or someone gets hurt, all of a sudden that's the lead story. All right, we have a series now. Someone's hurt, whatever the situation may be. And I hope no one gets hurt, obviously. But 
if the Giants trade up and then draft one of these top quarterbacks, that could be a huge story. That could be the biggest story tomorrow. So a lot of different things in play. I don't see any case in which the Jets are the lead story tomorrow. And that's what's fun about the NFL draft. They could surprise us, but I don't see any case in which the Jets, unless they take a quarterback in the first round, are the lead story later tonight slash tomorrow. So that's what I got for you guys. Enjoy the draft. Enjoy game three. The Knicks, it's time. Dominate game three. Go on the road. Show them what you're made of. Jalen, it's time. Show up, Jalen Brunson. Be the guy you were all year. Be the MVP of this team. Take over a game in Philly. Get the MVP chance on the road in Philly. Take that crowd out of it. Let's see what happens. They have to come out strong because you know the Sixers down 2-0 at home are going to come out strong. So the the Knicks, they got to punch back. They got to be strong in this game. We'll see what happens. That'll do it for me, Rami Love V Podcast. Thank you for listening, watching, viewing, liking, subscribing, all that stuff. I appreciate it. Until next time, we will see you.